Hello, everyone. This is the Advisor Innovations Podcast. I'm David Armstrong. This, as you know, is the podcast where we speak to individuals moving forward the business of financial advice. And today I'm thrilled to speak to Rick Worcester, the president of Charles Schwab, and Bernie Clark, the managing director and head of advisor services. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, Thanks for having, having us on. So you guys have been busy. I haven't spoken to you since the transition. Uh, the TD Ameritrade advisors that have come over over the Labor Day weekend. Tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, our understanding is that things went pretty well. The word is that things went smoothly. No major breakage. Uh, uh, everything seems to be fine. Very minor anecdotal complaints, but largely uh, you pulled it off, which is great. Congratulations. That's a, a, you know, difficult thing to do, I know. Do you want to just uh, maybe, Bernie, take just a second to reflect a little bit on, on what you accomplished there uh, and how it came together and what maybe you were worried about? on that final weekend. Yeah, David, it was uh, it was quite quite the milestone for us as, as you can imagine and you know the largest integration certainly for advisors and, and I think for companies uh, that we've seen in our industry and uh, and it went very very well. Uh, but I would say it was it was a partnership really. It was a partnership with with our advisors or our partners or our clients uh, if you will and we worked together on it very very diligently and, and so a lot of attention was paid to uh, Labor Day weekend, of course, but it started well, well before then. We've been working on this with, with our advisors for two years now, helping to train, helping to forecast and show uh, what this would all look like, uh, making sure we took the best of both worlds uh, from, from both the Ameritrade platform and the Schwab platform, and, and make sure we captured something that would really be a, the creation of a launching pad for this next generation for advisors of platforms and capabilities, which are so critically important to all of them. Uh, in continuing to grow their businesses. So in August, uh, there was a sort of a quiet day that no one paid much attention to. It was advisor day one. Uh, and we started bringing the advisors on board to see all the data, to verify, to check, to get ready for client day one, which was Labor Day weekend. And with their help uh, and, and the work that we had done, Labor Day weekend went very, very well for, for the clients of our advisors and for our advisors and certainly for us. Yeah, it was great. And and like I say, I mean, the 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 reviews are good. Rick, maybe from a larger Schwab perspective, there's been some in some of your recent business uh, uh, updates, um, some discussion about attrition. Do, I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, the percentage of Schwab or TD Ameritrade advisors that came over or the assets that came over? Uh, what was left behind? If, if it was left behind, why? Is there a, something you could tell us a little bit about the overall level of uh, converted assets and attrition? Sure. But, you know, maybe before I talk about attrition, I'd love to talk about, you know, add some comments to Bernie's about how well this went. And from my standpoint, what's exciting about the conversion is that now all advisors can enjoy the full benefits of our combined offer. A custodial platform that I think has never been stronger in the history of the industry than coming out of this conversion. We get the best of Everything Ameritrade had to offer, whether it's uh, ThinkPipes or iRebal or Model Market Center, we now have those available to both sets of clients. The combined functionality that we have in Schwab Advisor Center, along with some of the uh, most popular features and functionality we took from Veo One, of course, some of the added capabilities that we have here at Schwab, like Schwab Charitable and Schwab Bank, features that Ameritrade didn't have clients didn't have access to, and and now. Both sets of clients are going to have access to all of this. And, and that's why we think coming out of this conversion, there's never been a stronger custodial offer in the marketplace. As it relates to attrition, we've seen some attrition, but, but that's to be expected. And, uh, and we had assumed there would be attrition. And, and the actual attrition we've seen has been less than, uh, you know, than, 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 we, than we thought we might see. And of course, attrition happens for a number of different reasons. Uh, it can happen because th there's not a great fit between us and, and the client. It doesn't make sense for us to take them on, either for economic reasons or, or other business reasons. And there's some clients that say, I, you know, I, don't, I already have a relationship somewhere else. I don't need another relationship. And, and they've consolidated with their, with their other relationships. So, so we did see some attrition. It was in line to, with, with what we expected. And of course, driven by a number of different considerations. Sure. So you say, and I want to get to some of the banking uh, services and uh, lending that you offer now. 
and how advisors can take advantage of that stuff. This was such a long process, the deservedly so, I, I mean, years in the making. While that was happening, there were competitors, right, who have uh, have been pulling out new new offerings to the marketplace. Uh, you know, we've seen Goldman Sachs have their, uh, you know, in, uh, custodial offer. Uh, Investnet has started to offer custodial services. Uh, some of the smaller players, the accesses, the altruists of the world. Bernie, did, taking so long to do this conversion, take your eye off the ball a little bit from the marketplace and allow competitors a little bit of a, a window to get in there? And how do you view the competitive landscape now? You know, David, it, it's always interesting to talk about the competitive landscape and even in the absence of a deal of this size. Uh, but one thing I want to just comment on the amount of time we took there are very few integrations that are completely done uh, when you see companies come together. Uh, I'd argue that mostly what you see are confederations of, of capabilities between the two joining firms, three joining firms, whatever that might happen to be. This is a true integration where we end up with single source of capability for everybody. Uh, and we thought that was the most critical thing for us to accomplish so there wouldn't be ongoing confusion after getting through the integration with any of our clients or our platform, uh, as, as Rick had said, creating sort of the industry leading. Now, when you get to the competitive landscape, uh, you know, I've always welcomed competition because it teaches us things. It keeps us sharp, right? And, and you see some of these smaller firms, uh, almost, almost cottage nascent entries, and, and, and they are trying to find their way into what is a fastest growing space in financial services. And and we'll see things that they'll do that will be interesting. Uh, but, but at the core of everything that we do is the safety and security of client assets, right? I mean, what could be more important than that? That's why they call us a custodian. And when you start to look at the size of Schwab now, the capability we have, the breadth of services that we have, uh, there could be no better place for people to safe keep their clients' assets as we go forward. Goldman Sachs, InvestNet in a different kind of way. We, we all talk within the industry. I've talked with InvestNet many times on the direction that they're going. Can never forget that InvestNet, a large constituency for them, are the wirehouses uh, and some of the capabilities they've had. So you always have to look at where the core of what the capabilities are being built for. Uh, we certainly are in a position where we're in the RIA business uh, and plan to be into perpetuity uh, and doing things that are good for advisors is critically important. And I think Goldman has some interesting things to offer. I don't know if it's in the custody space or if it's in the product distribution space, uh, but that'll be for them to decide. They've, they've looked at it a lot of different ways so far. And again, we sort of welcome that competition, that push for us to go forward. I mean, one of the things that I always like to joke a little bit about, David, is, is the fact that Meritrade did a fabulous job looking for any crack they could in our platform. Uh, they were our most competitive per, uh, team, if you will, in the industry competing with us for advisor assets. So although they weren't the, the largest co competitor, uh, they found opportunities where sometimes we couldn't. Uh, and now bringing them together, we have the benefit of bringing those capabilities together with our capabilities and joining them and making an even stronger platform for RAs to grow. That's, that's an interesting point, Bernie. Then, then Rick, I would ask you, who do you consider your competitors now? Well, we, we have lots of competitors, and I would say that the thing we focus on is just making sure we deliver for our clients. So it's, with $3.7 trillion of, of assets and the size and scale in this industry that we can deliver outstanding experiences and the, and the safety of, of the assets that clients demand, we, we need to deliver. That's what we're focused on, making sure we, ought, we have a very compelling offer for clients. There will always be competitors. But if we if we take care of our client, we feel like we're in a really good position. Sure. Um, yeah. And you, you certainly can't ignore you can't ignore Fidelity. Obviously, has had success in this space. They have success in the clearing business. I think uh, I think if as you look you know at, at Pershing, they too have some success in this space, but most mostly in the clearing business as well. Uh, certainly, formidable competitors that we've known for a long, long time uh, in the industry and alternatives uh, for our clients to look towards. Uh, the new joiners leading a lot with technology. Of course, technology is always an arms race with sometimes people being ahead or behind, but always catching up with each other. Uh, we have a firm belief that at Schwab on our retail side, on our retirement side, and within the advisor business, that most importantly are people uh, and having capability within our firm, having long tenured employees, and then augmenting them with great technology 
uh, to support them. But remember, we're in a relationship business uh, and, and you can't be in relationship without having people on your side as well. And, and I think we've done a fabulous job over my tenure here, which obviously is quite long, uh, in making sure that we put out the best and the brightest uh, for our clients. Sure. When it, when it comes to custody of um, independent advisory assets, uh, one of the moves we've seen most prominently, I think, over the past few years is the independent broker-dealer space kind of rolling out fee-only custodial services for independent advisors. LPL now claims to be the third largest custodian of independent advisors out there. Um, I guess we could quibble, but do you see some threat from the independent broker-dealer side? You know, it's it, David, it's always been there. Uh, the independent broker-dealer business has always been a, a large winner from the defections of smaller advisors from traditional wirehouses. Uh, and the flow has always been a little bit stronger there because if you will, it represents sort of a halfway point for advisors to come out and not be an employee, not be a W-2, uh, be, be a 1099 within these firms and to be somewhat independent. What we've learned uh, is that the IBDs are also a feeder organization to independence, right? Because people come out, they, they get their feet underneath them, uh, they begin to enjoy the independence that they have, and they realize there's another step they can take to being fully independent. One thing I'd ask you to think about as, as you're going forward in, in future podcasts or, or as you're, I know you're always very inquisitive about the industry, is there's a whole new phenomena starting. I wouldn't call it even new, but joins, we call them. And, and it's really what it is, are people coming out and opposed, uh, as opposed to going to maybe an LPL or a, another independent broker dealer. What they're doing is they're starting to join large advisory firms. Uh, and they're joining them in platforms that represent both W-2 employee platforms, but also 1099 platforms and getting all the capabilities they need with a little more independence than they might see in some of those other models. It's quite interesting. Uh, and it, it also is a fiduciary model. Uh, remember, you know, the, the definition of fiduciary and, and, you know, most advisors who make their way to an independent broker dealer tend to wean themselves off the commission products and get to fee-only advisors so they can declare that, that fiduciary independence that they really want to have. You can do that more rapidly now by joining uh, an existing independent advisor in, in that way. And, and so that's become quite attractive. And we see it, you might call it M&A. Uh, we see it more in that M&A type of world. Sure. A, a broader place for advisors to land, given the, you know, as well as I do, we used to talk about the rarity of the $1 billion RIA. And now <laughs> yeah. Um, um, not so rare anymore, is it? <laughs> no, not so rare. And do you do you think that that's a, a you know I, from your perspective, and and I know you've had other things to focus on recently, but is that a trend that continues? Has it uh, decreased a little bit because of the uh, economic environment, higher interest rates? Where do you see uh, the M and A trend for RIAs going? You know, if you look at the pure M and A trend, I think the numbers will tell you that it's a little bit down. Uh, I will tell you what I see is the activity is up more than more than down, and uh, the multiples clearly have gotten quite a bit higher. Uh, and again, uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can join. There's more and more firms participating. Uh, I could name them, but then I'd probably forget a few, and someone would feel bad about that. Uh, but there are quite a few quality firms uh, that custody with us who are in the business of, of bringing on teams from teams from wirehouses. Uh, they're in the business of bringing on teams from IBDs. Uh, in some cases, they're rolling up teams of independent advisors who have kind of reached their limits, uh, haven't quite gotten further uh, in their growth, and they can help them to accelerate their growth. You know, the central centralization of services uh, is a critical aspect. Let's be honest, this whole industry, we always talk about who wants to be in it. It is a skinny margin business of uh, being a custodian. It is a, a reasonably skinny margin business in general. Uh, and the idea of creating scale and capability, which is how we drive ourselves, is very, very important to advisors as well. They haven't been upping their fees as they went along. In fact, if anything, they've been adding services and lowering their margins. So they need to be more capable. They need to be more scalable within their businesses. So there's there's a really a great symmetry between what we're trying to accomplish and what they're trying to accomplish. And so as we create capability, uh, we're really helping ourselves. And at the same time, we're helping advisors. So it's it's worked out quite well for us. Yeah, I mean, you talk about that symmetry. There's the I think one of the reasons that we see a lot of the folks gravitating to the wealth management space is because the margins are larger than they are in the custodial space or the broker space. And I'm, I'm sure you see that at Schwab as well, Rick. You know, we've talked about this forever, uh, but this uh, you know supposed uh, competition between 
uh, the advisor and the custodian, particularly with Schwab. You know, do you want us to talk a little bit about that landscape record and where you see that line blurring between what you do for the, the retail client, for lack of a better word, or and and the advisor? Uh, I mean, you've made some moves with the private client services. Uh, we saw that automatically enrolling one million dollar plus, ten million dollar plus advisor or clients on the retail side into uh, the private client services or the private wealth services, I guess they're called now. Do you want to speak a little bit about that and maybe the uh, the acquisition of the Family Wealth Alliance? I think that was another one that caught people's attention as a potentially blurring this line of you know, competition with with your RAA clients. Yeah, so as it relates to competition, that that's something that will come up from time to time with the RIAs that, that custody with us. And I like to point out that that collectively we have a, an 11 or 12 percent share. We we what we just, say to just, our just RIA, report, 12 percent share of the entire of the, of the entire industry's assets. So there's 88 percent share of assets that are being served somewhere else. So collectively, we have an opportunity to grow our share and to go compete against that 88 percent. We don't need to be competing against each other. And, and any time we run into a client situation where, where an RIA says, hey, it, it feels like you're competing with me, we stand down immediately. And, and we have an open offer to any RIA when, when, when they feel like we're in competition with them, just call us. And, and of course, that hardly ever happens because we don't really practically compete with each other. There's 12% of the market that we have today and 88% that we don't. And so we're all going out there trying to help the end client. To me, the bigger goal is how, how do we help end clients get to where they need to be in, in their financial life, whether that's through an RIA or whether that's directly with us. Our mission is to make sure the client ends up better off in their financial life than they would be otherwise. And we, and we do that either through the RIA or we do it, uh, we do it directly. So I don't, I don't view there as being a competition we spend uh, an incredible amount of energy trying to make the RIA successful, whether it's through the work we do as a, as a, as a custodian or whether it's through the work we do consulting with the RIA and helping them grow and, and manage their business. And so we really are focused on the whole pie, not on, not on the small part uh, that, that collectively we hold together. So, and just uh, to press on this one point a little bit, a client who uh, on the retail side passes one of those marks, a uh, million, a 10 million, uh, gets automatically thrown into this channel of, of private wealth services. Where do you make a distinction between what we're going to do with that client in terms of a referral to an RIA outside or what we're going to do in terms of serving them internally as a retail client with our private wealth services? It's going to come down to our, what we believe is most important, which is seeing through clients' eyes. What is best for the client? If it's best for them to work with uh, with an RIA, we'll we'll put them in touch with an RIA that could meet their needs. If if what they want and and what can help them is to work here with directly with Schwab, then then we'll do we'll do that. It's really about seeing through clients' eyes and doing right by the client. You, you brought up the launch of our Schwab Private Wealth Services. We have tried to bring and meet the segmented needs of our client base. We know that as wealth goes up, the needs of those clients changes. And so what that launch of Schwab, Schwab Private Wealth Services was about is a recognition of, that those clients with $10 million or more have different needs. And so we're able to meet them with a, with a wealth consultant who has specialized knowledge about clients with that level of wealth as well as a number of specialists who can help them. Those are all people who provide advice or consultation to that end client. That's different than being a fiduciary and sitting beside the client and, and helping take ownership of their financial life. And so there really is a difference between that Schwab Private Wealth Services offer and what an RIA may offer. And whichever makes most sense for the client and the client wants, we're going to make sure they get. It's all about seeing through client's eyes. Sure. You spoke a little bit about the services that advisors are looking for. And one of the, you know, we, we hear this all the time on the advisor side, you know, the, the increasing services for the clients are important. It's what they're doing. They're adding services. A lot of this merger and acquisition activity is driven by a need to add services to the advisor's offering. How are you guys helping plan to help uh, advisors with things like banking, securities, lending, 
uh, any insurance, any of the other uh, aspects that an advisor touches with the client uh, that maybe a custodian could help. And then the RA does not have to go out somewhere else to get those services. Well, I'm happy to start yeah. first. And, and Oh, go, yeah, go ahead, Bernie. No, go, please. Well, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing in banking, which I think is a good step in that direction. We just recently launched a new digital pledged asset line experience. We're now an RIA in, in five minutes or less can complete a pledged asset line application. And then within, within the course of a week, have money in the, in the client's account. And to us, that is uh, really in line with trying to do as much as we can to make the life easier for the end client and to make life easier for the, for the RIA. And of course, for us, it's just a way of expanding the relationship and, and helping serve our clients. So that's a good example to me of, of how we can do more. But Bernie, how about you? Yeah, and no, I, I think the liability side of the balance sheet uh, is something that really our clients have been asking us to help them with quite aggressively for some time. And having a bank, having a bank that is, is run the way our broker dealer is run with safety and security in mind of, of its clients uh, I think it's so critically important, especially with the year we've just gone through, a safe haven for those capabilities. Uh, they know, as, as Rick has said, uh, if, if there's a competition at some point in time, oddly, uh, we will back down. Uh, and and our, our clients also recognize that their lending sources that they've traditionally gone to uh, become very competitive for the assets that they actually manage on the wealth side. Uh, and so they're reticent to, to be going in those directions, and they should be. Uh, and so I think pledged asset, uh, is a great, great capability, and, and we are there now, which I'm, I'm quite proud to say we've been working hard at delivering an, another symbol that, you know, remember, we didn't stop doing business during the integration. Uh, we were working on lots of other things, and, and it's an example of something we've accomplished. We want to be in the ultra high net worth mortgage market, whole loan market, balance sheet type loans. That's going to be critical as well to the ultra affluent of our client of our clientele. Uh, in making sure we could serve them on, on both the retail and the institutional side, the advisor side. You know, one of the things, you know, just to, to backtrack a tiny bit, as, as I've mentioned it, uh, is the fact that, you know, during the integration, it took a while, but we weren't simply working on the integration. We were modernizing all of our platforms, modulizing our platforms, putting ourselves in a better position for the future. Uh, and as we've seen, there's lots of new legislation, new regulation, uh, we want to be more nimble to all of that. We've got T1 coming. I've got, it, took, it took us two decades to get from T3 to T1. Uh, and, and I remember going through T3 uh, back when I was at Deutsche Bank in London, and it was a horrific event. It was hard. It was arduous. It was long in coming. And T1, you know, just thankfully just feels like it's, it's just going to find its way uh, with lots of hard work. Uh, but we'll be there, uh, you know, in the first quarter, hopefully so. So, so we are in a much better position to grow than I think we ever have before because of the integration uh, in things like pledged assets and, and more on the liability side that the bank can deliver on. Maybe even, maybe even as far as <clears throat> lending to advisors, creating some capital in the space. You know, capital has been such a driver of the M&A. Yeah. It's been such a driver of some of the consolidations that we've seen, some of the joins that we've seen. But in some cases, it's the needed component for some of those firms that have stalled a bit, well, no matter what level they've stalled at, a billion, 500,000, sometimes along with scale, a little bit of capital helps them going off a lot further. You do help the RAs that are on the platform perhaps find each other in terms of succession planning and this kind of thing. But uh, as of yet, no capital solution for advisors looking to grow? You know, we, we have some smaller capital programs uh, that we've employed. Uh, but we haven't certainly we certainly haven't taken on, taken ownership. We're just always thinking about how can we participate in this space. It was you know well documented that we made it we made a, a rather significant investment in a, in a silent way or if you will in a passive way uh, with a provider in the industry, Dynasty Partners, and and so that was obviously you know us helping to grow capability in the industry. We've we've yet to get into a, a, a place where we are actually joining in any of the economics of an advisor. But we do um, do some capital lending uh, when advisors are going into independence just to get them up and started, uh, if you will. Uh, that's that's a hard transition for people, not just the movement of the clients, but getting offices and equipment and all of that set up uh, is something that we, we help advisors with. And, and we're going to explore 
Are there more ways for us to help get this next generation of advisors into an ownership position within the firms they're in? I mean, the, the growth has been so enormous within these practices, some of them starting two to three decades ago, that it's really hard for, for a junior partner to take equity because they've become their, their book value has become so large. And obviously, they need some borrowing capability from a friendly uh, to be able to do that. Yeah, it's an interesting area. You took the ownership stake or, or a small equity stake in, in Dynasty. Would you do that again with other of the platforms? There's certainly a few out there. We, we, are, we are way open to that concept of Dynasty Asked. Uh, we see them as a good partner. We see them as helping to grow the pie, if you will, within the industry. Uh, and, and as someone who's providing capability that brings more assets into the independent space. When we see all of those things converge in the right kind of way, uh, I think I think passive investing in those models to help them continue to grow in the way they want to is certainly something that we would consider. We're not we're not we've never been in the business of trying to pick winners. You know, we're in we're in the business of trying to make sure we keep increasing the size uh, of which we can serve the assets in. Mm -hmm. And David, I would just underscore one of one of the points Bernie made. The investment in Dynasty was about investing in the in in the entire industry and trying to grow the industry. Dynasty plays a real, you know, an important role in that regard, helping uh, helping breakaways, helping provide services to other advisors, and so that was really an investment in growing the industry. And th those kind of investments are really on strategy for us, and and a big part of what we've done as a company, and 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 certainly Bernie's played a big role in this, is growing the industry. And if you look back over the last ten years, I believe the industry. It has roughly tripled in terms of size. And so, again, we're going to do whatever we can to facilitate the growth of the industry because we think it's an outstanding model for the end client and has done a lot of good things to help clients get to where they need to be in their financial life. And when a company like a dynasty comes along that plays an important role in the formation of RIAs and the growth of RIAs, it's really uh, on strategy to invest in that company and do whatever we can to help help them be uh be successful in, in a passive with a passive investment. Sure. So, so we might see more of that in, in the future. What's next here uh, for Schwab on the advisor side? Uh, we've talked about the banking, you know, we've, we, I know the, the customization tools uh, rolled out, you know, we know about that stuff. Where, where are the needs that you see that advisors have that are not being met that you are looking to build or acquire solutions to meet? You know, I, I'm going to I'm going to jump to one of the obvious ones, and and that's the fact that we it, the industry is so at risk to cyber risk, security fraud, uh, the things that come along with that, and a very very big deterrent to all of that is digitization. Now, you know, if if there's a silver lining to the pandemic, which I hate to say because it was such a horrific event, uh, it is the fact that there was an acceleration of thought around becoming more digital, being more virtual, where you needed to be virtual, uh, and so. We're going to pursue every opportunity we can, can to start to eliminate paper, to get wet signatures out of the process, to interrupt the flow where we find the fraudsters are, are most apt to enter into transactions uh, and put, put assets at risk. You know, in fact, I'd argue the Ameritrade advisors are coming over in a way that's, that we're embracing in a fabulous way, that they, they're coming over in a digitized way. And, and so we might be starting with them in even a better place uh, as we're trying to transition many of our other clients. And I'm, of course, talking about things like money movements, empowerments, authorities, all of those kinds of things. It will be a better, safer place uh, for advisors to be able to do their business, protect their franchise uh, while we're helping to protect them as well. So so that's that's the obvious. The, the not so obvious in, in the replacement of, of what had been the crypto forever conversation has now become AI. Right. Uh, and we're not talking about in alternative investments here. Right. It's artificial intelligence. Uh, and what are the possibilities around that? We've got a we've got a group, an advisory board, if you will, of advisors who are talking to us about where they see opportunities in that space, uh, ideas that they're having. Uh, it's, it's early, early days. Uh, certainly there's going to be some opportunity in the efficiency side of things uh, using AI. But we also think there's going to be a lot in the predictive nature of serving their clients, uh, which again, it will be, I think, an additive thing to their practices as we go forward. Yeah, for sure. Rick, I want to give you a, a chance to talk a little bit about the, the 
uh, I guess for lack of a better word, the economics of the custodial business is one of the things that some of the competitors gripe about with a uh, uh, Schwab, you know, some of these payment for order flow, cash sweep accounts. You know, we, we can talk about the the merit of those arguments, but you know, what do you see on the the, the economics of the custodian business relating to the entirety of Schwab? And, and how would you address the criticism of payment for order flow or cash sweep accounts as they exist? Uh, some say that maybe it's some of that revenue or some of that uh, benefit, economic benefit should be shared with the advisor. Perhaps it already is in different ways. Let me know your thoughts. I would say we we continue to thrive at Schwab and the RIA business is a, is a really important part of that. If you look at the first half of the year, generated over $107 billion of net new assets from RAA clients. And the RAA business this year is contributing about 60% of, uh, of net new assets to the firm. And we now stand at you know close to $4 trillion of assets. So the economics in the RIA business and, and the contribution to overall Schwab has been outstanding. In terms of our overall economics, you know, while, while the industry this year has been in the spotlight, we continue to deliver the economics we always have historically. We, we just, I believe, produced our last, uh, the second quarter produced our 11th straight quarter of profit margins in excess of, of 40%. So we, we continue to thrive economically. In terms of some of the specific areas you asked about, let me start with cash sweep. You know, the number one goal we have is to make it easy for clients to manage their cash with us in line with their financial goals. The first thing we do with cash is, is we do sweep it to a, uh, to, a, to a bank sweep account. And the reason we do that is that until we know what the purpose of that cash is, or until the RIAs had a chance to assess the purpose of that cash, we want to default it to the most liquid, safest place for cash that exists. And that's FDIC insured cash uh, in, in our bank. And we pay... 45 basis points on that, which is is more than uh, most of our competitors pay for for bank sweep. So then we allow, not allow, we we actively encourage the RIA to be having a discussion with the client about the purpose of that cash. Is it something they need in a day or two or, or a week, or do they want to invest that cash? And 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 when the answer is yes, there's more goals for that that cash. We have a plethora of options for the RIA from which to choose that offer far higher yields. And we've seen client cash, particularly on the advisor services side, move in that direction. So our goal is, is always to make it easy for clients to manage their cash and to find the, the, the offer that makes the most sense for them. But we default them to bank sweep because of liquidity and security. Mm-hmm. In terms of PFOV, we have the strongest, deepest, most liquid and most efficient and transparent markets in the world. And PFOV you know, is, is an outcome of a, of a very efficient market. And if you look at our execution statistics, they're outstanding and, and they've never been better and they're incredibly competitive. And so you know, PFOV, it's important to keep in mind with, with PFOV that we, we are saving clients money from an execution standpoint going, going through the wholesale market and the and the savings and the PFOB that we do generate, the vast majority of those savings go to the client. And again, it ends, ends up back in the client's pocket through better execution. So now the PFOB structure may evolve. As you know, it's uh, being scrutinized by the SEC. And if, and, if, and if that does change, we'll evolve with it. It's important to, to know though, that if PFOB does evolve, it's not going to have a huge impact on our economics. Uh, the, the current regulations are focused on equity PFOB, which are a small part of our overall uh, overall economics here at Schwab. Yeah, and, and the reason I bring it up, I think you know we've had this conversation before about uh, there there are some in the industry who suggest that maybe advisors would be be more honest if they were paying for custodial services rather than having the custodian make the money on the other side. Bernie, how would you address those thoughts? I think there's still people out there who think uh, paying for an, an RA, paying directly for custodial services would be the better option. I, th- I think that's the opinion of a lot of people who don't have a bank. <laughs> so so, so as, as you think about the, cap- the capabilities that advisors provide, 
uh, you know, really it's been a passive pay model. Um, they've enjoyed it. Their clients have enjoyed it. It, it is something that we offer. Uh, advisors have never wanted to take us up on, on the offer of going in a different direction. Uh, we'll listen to them most often uh, to see if, if they have a need. A very, very small percentage uh, do do that with their clients. Uh, but by and large, it's, it's always been a, an industry driven by transaction fees, OERs, uh, and, and other means along those lines. It's, it's quite visible to their, to their, to their clients uh, and, so, and something I think will persist well into the future. And it, it's how they, quite honestly, they also keep their costs down to their clients. You know, we, we, we talk with advisors all the time and, and someone actually challenged me the other day. I always say that 25% of the value proposition an advisor provides to their client is, is the portfolio, uh, their financial portfolio. Uh, and someone challenged me to say that they think it's actually dropped to 20% or lower. Uh, really what they're doing is, is they're doing life planning, they're doing discipline, they're working on next generations, they're educating, they're using consulting as we use consulting to, to deepen the relationships uh, with their clients. Uh, the portfolio really, it's, it's an expectation of a client that it's safe, it's secure, and that it's growing but it is not the primary reason. Tax, estate, uh, there's a whole litany of things, as you know, that advisors have engaged themselves in in a very customized way with their clients. And that's highly valued by their clients. So, so if they see the need to, to differentiate or change their means or their economics or the clients demanded from them, then, then as, well, as uh, Rick has said, we certainly will adjust our thinking to that uh, should they want to do that. And you mentioned that point about customization. That's I think exactly right. That's what the advisor is doing for the end client. Uh, the portfolio has been kind of largely commoditized. That said, uh, we're told that uh, advisors uh, are beginning to look broader than just the public markets. And this will be my final question. I know we're running up against the time, um, but uh, advisors are beginning to look beyond the broader, beyond just the publicly traded markets for equities, bonds, into alternatives private equity, private placements, other kinds of uh, uh, investments like that to bring into the client portfolio. Are you guys facilitating that at all? Will you facilitate that at all? How would you do so? We we are, David. And, and as you've, you've seen many, many cycles in our industry, this is such a, certainly a natural, natural movement. And we've seen real movement towards alternatives. And when I talk about real movement, I think Rick threw out a number before that said we have close to $4 trillion in advisor assets. I think, I think we have grown to 30 billion in alternatives or somewhere in that zip code. Uh, so it is still, alternatives are still a fraction of the portfolio, very available. Uh, we're, we're actually engaged with all of the major provider, ICAP, CASE, uh, and we basically, we listen to, to our clients again, our advisors. Uh, when they have a need in the alternative market, they bring it to us and then we find a way to create access for them. We're a great access point for all of that for advisors and we will continue to be. Uh, and we'll see with market cycles, you know, active, inactive, passive investing. Uh, these all have their place. I, I think personalized indexing uh, is something we're really excited about. We think it satisfies, it scratches a lot of inch, itches for, for advisors and them trying to craft things for their for their clients as they go forward. Model portfolios, I rebal, a huge pickup. I've heard about I rebal my entire career at Schwab. And why don't we have something that's the equivalent of TDs I rebal? And, and now we do. Uh, and I'm excited about that. And, and of course, ThinkPipes is going to create a great trading platform, but take a great trading platform, make it even better uh, as we go forward. So all of these things are additive. And, and as always, you can call it through client eyes, but we listen to our advisors when they have needs to grow, when they have needs to serve their clients. That's what we do as a custodian. We remain nimble uh, and we try and bring them access to those needs. Fantastic. Rick, any final thoughts on uh, the, the the landscape going forward? Uh, what can RAs expect? I think from us, it's it's such an exciting time having gone through the, the Labor Day conversion because now we have this offer that is as strong as it's ever been. It's the it's the best of what Ameritrade always had with iRebal and, and think pipes and some of the compelling features of AO1 combined with the size and scale that we've already had and the capabilities, whether it's Schwab Charitable, the bank, uh, some of the, the features that we have on schwabadvisorcenter.com. There, there's never been a more exciting time for us as a custodian, and, and we've never think there's been a, a more compelling offer than we that what we have here together. And so the, the future for us is, is both very bright and very exciting, and we're looking forward to taking the best of both 
and using it to elevate the way we deliver for RIAs and allowing them to elevate how they deliver for their end clients. And, and if we can collectively do that, the clients in our industry that are that are relying upon RAs will be better off in their financial life. And that ultimately is our goal. So I, I would just wrap up by saying there's there's never been a more exciting time for us as a custodian than, than it is today. All right. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, uh, both of you, uh, Bernie Clark, Rick Worcester, thanks very much for joining us. I guess we'll see you at uh, Impact coming up at the, the end of the month or, or some of us will, you know, uh, uh, looking forward to it. And uh, we'll keep the conversation going. Thanks for joining Advisor Innovations. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yep. This has been the Advisor Innovations Podcast. I'm David Armstrong. Thanks for listening. 